help us instruct us in our in our Christian walk, very kind of practical and applied uh, areas. And uh, but as uh, Thanksgiving uh, is coming up this week, I had a few things on my mind uh, tonight. If you come over to the community service, um, you're going to hear something from Ephesians chapter 5. Oh, there's a chance you'll hear the same stuff in a few points, but that's okay uh, because we probably need to hear a lot, a lot of the word over and over again. Anyway, let's take a look here. I think this struck me when we were doing this study uh, with the adult class here. Um, over several months, we went through the book of Hebrews. And there's a lot there, a uh, lot, of, lot of teaching. Um, but it, it came to me as uh, we got to this part, I said, hey, do Christians offer sacrifices? And of course, well, especially if you know the book of Hebrews, you would initially think, uh, well, no, of course not. We don't offer sacrifices. There are no animals being slaughtered here, and that kind of thing. Um, and yet you come to this teaching here, so you realize there are Christian offerings and sacrifices, but what are they? What are they? So read just a couple of verses here, Hebrews 13, 15, and 16, as we consider what are our Christian sacrifices. Give attention. This is the word of the Lord. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. This ends the reading of God's holy word. I would imagine all of you, um, in one way or another, if I said, do you really want to please God? You really want to make God happy? You want to please God? And everybody in this room would say, yeah, sure, I want to please God. Um, if I were to say, you know, is it kind of hard to know what to do to please God sometimes? You think, well, maybe there's times where I, I don't know whether I'm doing what God wants me to do. I don't know whether I'm living faithfully in certain ways. I know there are certain sins that I keep struggling with and whatever. And so, you know, we, we, we kind of walk around and live with a sense that, well, maybe we're not doing all that we should and feel a little bit bad about that. Um, but what's nice is, is that sometimes in the Scripture, there's something very direct and really doable that helps us to know, one, however you would phrase it, either to know exactly what we can do to please God, or if I had read, and I have done this on, uh, around Thanksgiving before from 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, we could call it the will of God, to know how to do the will of God. There's some places where it says doing this is pleasing to God or doing this is the will of God. And it, wow! There it is. It's very direct, very simple. In doing this, we can be sure what I'm about to tell you, what I'm about to tell you, if we devote ourselves to doing these things, we can be sure this is pleasing to God. You know why? Because it says it so directly and so clearly. Right at the end of the text. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. And the thing is, is that some of the, what is said here, you know, sometimes the most simple teachings, we can start overlooking them. You know, we can just start missing because they're so simple. It's like the things that are always in front of you. Uh, I, I, didn't real, I didn't realize how beautiful this part of the country was until we lived in Mississippi for four years. And it, and it has its own beauty, okay? We don't speak bad Mississippi in our house, okay? But that's what the sign says when you pull into the state. It says no, no, uh, what does it say? No, no. Um, no bad, bad Mississippi spoken here or something like that. It's, that's what it says on their state signs. In other words, I know everybody likes to take their jabs at Mississippi, but it don't happen when you come here. That's the idea. And we have wonderful friends there. They have their own beauty. But you know what? They don't have any mountains. They just don't have them. Uh, maybe a bump here and there, but no, no mountains. And being away from it. So the most obvious things, the things that are always around you, can easily be missed and forgotten just because it's there all the time. And you stop paying attention to it as much. Well, there's some things of Scripture, there's some things of our Christian responsibility that are, seem to be so evident and so foundational. I would say simple, but I don't mean simple in the sense of unimportant or insignificant. I mean just 
foundational, elementary. Maybe you teachers would like that. Elementary, it's, it's basic. What are they? Well, let's see, what they, let's see what it says here in these few verses that will tell us if we will devote ourselves to these things, if we carry these things out, you can be sure God is pleased. Starts with this. Therefore, or, or through Jesus, therefore, or through him, it's probably very literally through him, but the NIV actually puts the name there because it, if you were to look back and figure out who him is, you have to go back several verses to find out that the whole context is about what Jesus has done for our redemption. And it's relating it to the tabernacle worship of the Old Testament. And it's making this little a comparison of how, probably re in reference to the Day of Atonement, how the victims, those animals that were sacrificed, either they, the sins were laid on the head and the goat was sent away, or the blood was presented in the tabernacle and the one that was died. But the, they were taken outside the camp. And it, the, the point there, if you read it in this context, I want to get this before I move into these specifics. The point of that is, is that these Hebrew Christians or Jewish Christians who are tempted to go back to their Judaistic ways to worship God in the old ways, the appeal is you've got to come outside the camp to come to the real Redeemer. He is outside the camp. Uh, it, it's almost depicted typologically in the life of Jesus. He, didn't, he wasn't in the city. He wasn't in the temple. He went to the temple, but where was he crucified? Where was this? Where was he? Well, you know, you know the story. He was left out of the city. And those kinds of uh, expressions are used to say, look, if you go hang out and think that you're going to find redemption, full salvation in the old ways, you're missing it. Those things led us to Jesus Christ and he has come. You've got to move out of the camps. So that's kind of the text. But it, it, it says very literally, and some of you probably read translations, it says through him, it's meaning Jesus because that's the context it's talking about. Talking about him as the Savior. He is the one who offered himself as a full sacrifice for sins, and it's only in him that you have redemption. That's the context. Through him, let us continually offer God a sacrifice of praise. Through him. So here's the first point. You want to please God? Then devote yourself to opening your mouth in praise to God for what he has done in Jesus Christ. Doesn't that sound simple? You know, just like asking the kids, what do we do? And they say, well, we sing. It just, singing seems like just preliminary, you know, let's fill in some of the space before, you know, the real thing happens. That is the offering. No, not the offering, but the preaching, right? The, it's the, um, it's, it, no, it's not that. Whatever else could be said about music and about style and about, you know, all the things that go into that, what you do have is the opportunity somebody has put before you to offer the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips, when you come. Whatever it is, what, whatever else may be said about music, and that seems to be, for whatever reason, music is the thing that has sort of created some controversy in the church. But it's opportunity to offer our praise to God for what he's done in Christ. I think that pass, the, the, uh, the phrase, through him or through Jesus, is very important here. Very important. It's not just offer it as if, okay, you come and you try the best you can to do something, okay? But through him, there's two things in view here at least. One is that through him means Jesus is in you and with you when you come to praise, when you come to worship. Kind of like that verse in Philippians. I know you remember not too long ago, did this sermon. I probably don't even need to say it again because you remember this. It says, I can do all things through him. In other words, it's the fact that Jesus is in me that I can deal with all, any circumstance. And in that context in Philippians, it was the fact that, oh, look, I can have plenty or I can have very little. I mean, I can live in abundance or I can live in poverty, basically. But I can handle it because through him, through Jesus, I can do all things. I can deal with those. 
through him offer the sacrifice of praise. Jesus is in you. Allow him to lead you to this, equip you in this, provide for you the proper attention and focus and attitude and motive when you come in worship. That he is in you, enables you, and and provides for you everything necessary to worship God well. Apart from him, apart from him, you wouldn't worship well. It is required that he is in you and working in you. Now, the other part is through Jesus, let our continual offer praise. I think also has this in mind, and I said it that way when I said, to offer our praise to God for what he has done for us in Jesus Christ. To through Jesus means to realize, you know, we have no right whatsoever to try to think God is going to pay attention to us, except that Jesus shed his blood for us. And if you read the rest of the book of Hebrews, you find out he is the great high priest. He's the ultimate high priest that his blood was presented in the very presence of God once and for all, meaning it didn't have to be repeated. It was final. It was full. It was complete. It was effectual in everything for us. Boy, if we could ever really let that sink into the depths of our hearts, we would never have trouble worshiping well. That we offer the sacrifice of praise, our singing of praise, our expressions of praise, through Jesus means we realize that our praise to God is for an inexpressible gift that we have in what Jesus has done for us. Now think about it. What do we desire? Well, we deserve condemnation and therefore hell. What have we gotten? We have gotten pardon and therefore heaven and glory. Why? Because Jesus bore the penalty, the guilt, the shame for us. That's what it means. Praise God for what Jesus has done. 